the themes of space and time are intertwined. Worlds and stars, like people, are born, live, and die. The lifetime of a human being is measured in decades, but the lifetime of the sun is a hundred million times longer. Matter is much older than life. Billions of years before the sun and earth even formed, atoms were being synthesized in the insides of hot stars and then returned to space when the stars blew themselves up. Newly formed planets were made of this stellar debris. The earth and every living thing are made of star stuff. But how slowly in our human perspective life evolved from the molecules of the early oceans to the first bacteria. The reason evolution is not immediately obvious to everybody is because it moves so slowly and takes so long. How can creatures who live for only 70 years detect events that take 70 million years to unfold, or 4 billion? By the time one-celled animals had evolved, the history of life on Earth was half over. Not very far along to us, you might think, but by now, almost all the basic chemistry of life had been established. Forget our human time perspective. From the point of view of a star, evolution was weaving intricate new patterns from the star stuff on the planet Earth and very rapidly. Now, let's take a closer look at who our ancestors were. A simple chemical circumstance led to one of the great moments in the history of our planet. There were many kinds of molecules in the primordial soup. Some were attracted to water on one side and repelled by it on the other. This drove them together into a tiny enclosed spherical shell, like a soap bubble which protected the interior. Within the bubble, the ancestors of DNA found a home and the first cell arose. It took hundreds of millions of years for tiny plants to evolve, giving off oxygen. But that branch didn't lead to us. Bacteria that could breathe oxygen took over a billion more years to evolve. From a naked nucleus, a cell developed with a nucleus inside some of these amoeba-like forms led eventually to plants. Others produced colonies with inside and outside cells performing different functions. Becoming a polyp attached to the ocean floor, filtering food from the water and evolving little tentacles to direct food into a primitive mouth. This humble ancestor of ours also led to spiny-skinned, armored animals with internal organs, including our cousin, the starfish. But we don't come from starfish. About 550 million years ago, filter feeders evolved gill slits, which were more efficient at straining food particles from the water. One evolutionary branch led to acorn worms. Another led to a creature which swam freely in the larval stage, but as an adult was still firmly anchored to the ocean floor. Some became living hollow tubes, but others retained the larval forms throughout the life cycle and became free-swimming adults with something like a backbone. Our ancestors now, 500 million years ago, were jawless, filter-feeding fish, a little like lampreys. Gradually, those tiny fish evolved eyes and jaws. Fish then began to eat one another. If you could swim fast, you survived. If you had jaws to eat with, you could now use your gills to breathe the oxygen in the water. This is the way modern fish arose. During the summer, some swamps and lakes dried up, so some fish evolved a primitive lung to breathe air until the rains came. Their brains were getting bigger. 
If the rains didn't come, it was handy to be able to pull yourself along to the next swamp. That was a very important adaptation. The first amphibians evolved, still with a fish-like tail. Amphibians, like fish, laid their eggs in water where they were easily eaten. But then a splendid new invention came along. The hard-shelled egg laid on the land where there were as yet no predators. Reptiles and turtles go back to those days. Many of the reptiles hatched on land never returned to the waters. Some became the dinosaurs. One line of dinosaurs developed feathers useful for short flights. Today, the only living descendants of the dinosaurs are the birds. The great dinosaurs evolved along another branch. Some were the largest flesh eaters ever to walk the land. But 65 million years ago, they all mysteriously perished. Meanwhile, the forerunners of the dinosaurs were also evolving in a different direction. Small, scurrying creatures, with the young growing inside the mother's body. After the extinction of the dinosaurs, many different forms developed. The young were very immature at birth in the marsupials, the wombat, for example, and in the mammals. The young had to be taught how to survive. The brain grew larger still. Something like a shrew was the ancestor of all the mammals. One line took to the trees, developing dexterity, stereo vision, larger brains, and a curiosity about their environment. Some became baboons. But that's not the line to us. Apes and humans have a recent common ancestor. Bone for bone, muscle for muscle, molecule for molecule. There are almost no important differences between apes and humans. Unlike the chimpanzee, our ancestors walked upright, freeing their hands to poke and fix and experiment. We got smarter we began to talk. Many collateral branches of the human family became extinct in the last few million years. We, with our brains in our hands, are the survivors. There's an unbroken thread that stretches from those first cells to us. Let's look at it again, compressing four billion years of evolution into 40 seconds. some of the things that molecules do, given four billion years of evolution. We sometimes represent evolution as the ever-branching ramifications of some original trunk, each branch pruned and clipped by natural selection. Every plant and animal alive today has a history as ancient and illustrious as ours. Humans stand on one branch, but now we affect the future of every branch of this four billion year old tree. Yeah.